agus madam va a huladunya, hamian dochus gavil shifkuma agus falcha orif rash. Hello everyone, a good morning to you all, and a very warm welcome back to the Plurilingual Lab speaker sessions. Is Misha Palmich and Shiblo, She Gail Ahanam, Ruga Agus Hochemi, Aunan Glasuhu, Aunan Alapa, Shinyach Ransahi Ahanam, Agus Isma Ur Kon Yehug. So I introduce myself in my now endangered language, Scottish Gaelic, um, and I'll now say it in English. My name is Paul Megan Chiblo. I'm a Scottish Gael born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland, and I'm a PhD candidate in educational studies focusing on Indigenous language revitalization at McGill University. I'm your host today uh, for the Plurilingual Lab speaker sessions. I'd just like to say it's an honour to be hosting you all and to be speaking with you all today. Now, before I introduce our wonderful panel speaker, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I am speaking to you today from Toronto to Toronto, and I would like to acknowledge this land, the plants, the waters, the animals and spirits, and all of our responsibilities to them. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land and territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and today is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work and to live on these lands. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous languages of Turtle Island, or what is now known as North and Central America. Indigenous languages are inseparable from the land and are still spoken to this day in Canada and across the globe. It is important to acknowledge our everyday collective responsibilities in ensuring Indigenous languages and Indigenous knowledges are equally validated and respected alongside colonial languages and colonial knowledge systems in language education and beyond. I'd invite you all to reflect on how you do this in your language and in your everyday practice. Miigwech agus tapaleif. Um, so with, without further ado then, it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Steve Marshall. Uh, he is a professor in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University, and his research focuses on plurilingualism and academic literacy in Canadian higher education, in first-year academic literacy courses, and across multiple disciplines. So, for example, applied sciences, political science, business, and linguistics. He's published research findings in various peer-reviewed journals and books, and is the author of the Advance in Academic Writing series published by Pearson ELT Canada. Just some Zoom etiquette before I pass the floor over to Dr. Marshall. Uh, please keep your video and sound off during the talk, please. You can, of course, use the thumbs up and hands clapping feature at any time. And just to make you aware, the talk will be recorded and available in the Plurilingual Lab YouTube channel as well. Now, after the talk, the talk should last approximately one hour, and there'll be 30 minutes for a Q&A session or for a discussion. You can post your questions in the chat. Um, you can feel free to do that during the talk or at the end of the talk. And at the end of the talk, you can also unmake your microphone and ask a question live. The discussion will be moderated by Ben Kalman and will not be recorded. So without further ado then, um, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Steve Marshall. It's our pleasure to have you today and I'll pass the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much everyone for coming out at different times of the day between um, the different time zones. It's around 9 a.m. here in Vancouver <clears throat> and um, spring has arrived. The older pollen is floating through the air and giving me very itchy eyes and nose. So I'm gonna try my best not to um, scratch my eyes and nose while, while I'm being recorded. But um, I may, if you see my screen go blank, don't worry, it's just for a, two or three seconds while I kind of like have a little scratch. Anyway, let's get on to the um, topic. The topic is plurilingualism across the disciplines in Canadian higher education. <coughs> I'm going to be looking at, at a range of issues from students' practices through to um, some of the dilemmas that instructors face when they're working in classes that are characterized by high degrees of linguistic diversity. Just setting my clock. 
So I'll do a quick run through of the abstract, which um, these are the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm just going to give an overview of research that I've done over the last 10 years, but focusing mainly on the most recent research I've been involved in. Um, <clears throat> I'll do a brief discussion about what I mean when I use the term plurilingual, but um, I won't go into it in really technical details, but I'm welcome to um, discuss it in the Q&A after. Um, I'll then present some findings from various research projects that I've carried out in the greater Vancouver area. I'll show some examples of students' plurilingual communication strategies in higher education contexts, recordings of plurilingual interactions as students negotiate and mediate learning, and also looking at some examples of how students <coughs> use different languages in the learning process in which they um, take notes, do drafts, etc. And I'll then also show some interview data um, from interviews with students and their instructors, where they're really conversations about language. And I'll, I'll also <coughs> look um, at instructors' views, how they understand their students' practices, and also um, look at some of the challenges that they face when they're teaching in classes which are characterized by um, high, large numbers of plurilingual students. So I'd like to begin with uh, land acknowledgement. So these are the three campuses where I work. At the top, we have SFU's Burnaby campus, perched atop Burnaby Mountain. And we have SFU's Surrey campus and the downtown Vancouver campus. And I think it's really important when we're doing research on languages, cultures, literacies, <clears throat> wherever we are in countries like Canada, that we recognize the history of the lands that we're doing our work in <clears throat> and where we're living. And across the three campuses at Simon Fraser University, we're living and working on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including, among others, the Musqueam, Squamish, Selwatooth, Coquitlam, and Katsi nations. I know we have an audience of people from different countries, so I'm just going to provide a brief overview of um, the, the history situation of Canada, the context of my research, um, and really the situation with Canada's languages and linguistic minorities. <clears throat> Canada has a quite complex and troubled history in this area. Um, <clears throat> Today, these are just rough figures, around 20% of the population of 36 million speaks French as a first language, or maybe as a joint first language, uh, most of whom live in Quebec and Eastern Canada. <coughs> Many immigrant languages are used in daily life in um, urban and also um, many rural parts of Canada. And there are around 60 indigenous languages um, all of which are in different degrees of endangerment of extinction. So an important thing for people who are less familiar with Canada is really the great size of the country. Um, I remember when I did a presentation in the UK, <clears throat> I was complaining that my son was so far away studying in Montreal. <clears throat> I live in Vancouver. And um, some, well, someone asked me, well, how far is it? And I said, it's five and a half hours. And they said, well, that's not too bad. That's like driving from London to Manchester on a bad day. And I said, no, it's five and a half hours flying. <clears throat> and um, this, this, this is um, a factor 
that that is relevant in terms of the you know spatial positioning of different linguistic communities and <clears throat> particularly if we look at the um, languages here in British Columbia their their location and also the fact that um, I'm working in a province which has a very small number of francophone um, speakers who are using francophone as their mother tongue as defined by the census you know looking between one and two percent of the population um, self report as having French as their um, first or dominant language <coughs> and Canada does have a troubled history of bilingualism and um, I'll just highlight a couple of facts Actually, in 1970, this was when my family moved from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, where I was born, to um, Bristol in the west of England. <clears throat> and a couple of months after we moved, um, Pierre Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act against the FLQ, the Front de Libération du Québec, essentially um, declaring martial law in Quebec. And <clears throat> this led to um, a kind of pr a process, culmination of this process was a policy of multiculturalism within a bilingual framework. <clears throat> In other words, um, opening Canada up to people from different cultures and welcoming their cultures officially in the policy, as long as it was in within a framework of the two official languages, um, French and English. And a notable absentee in this policy um, was the um, presence and position of indigenous languages as being recognized as official or part of this bilingual framework. And today, um, what's interesting for me is how this policy and this framing it has endured, but is also really, I think, cracking at the edges as well in many aspects when it comes to language policies. And then another key event, the, correct, the Quebec referendum in 1995, where <clears throat> the um, vote for sovereignty felt very, um, it came very close to winning the referendum with a vote of 49.42% <clears throat> and with those against national sovereignty, 50.58% um, with a very high turnout. And some of the <clears throat> um, media reports at the time and some of the research I've looked at around this topic show that um, one group who bore the brunt of this um, vote not being successful in terms of sovereignty were new Canadians or immigrants to Quebec. Here's a, another map of Canada showing the spread of Indigenous languages. And I always like to, when I, when I look at maps of Canada, I'm a bit of a map nerd, um, I like to compare Canada to Chile in, in South America because in terms of where people live, Canada is a very long, thin country with most people living around 200 kilometers from the border with the US. And, um, <clears throat> but you can see that the, the, spread of the spread of indigenous languages is um, much broader. And one of the ironies is that um, isolation and lack of access to resources um, has always been one factor which in some ways protects uh, indigenous language speakers from um, the language shift that um, leads to the endangerment of their languages. And more recently in Canada we've <coughs> been coming to terms with the horrendous legacy of the residential school system between 1840 and 1996, in which um, children were taken from their, indigenous children were taken from their families <coughs> and forced to attend schools run by different religious organizations. And um, this is an ongoing history and something that the country is coming to terms with, with the discovery of um, graves and many, um, many painful wounds are being reopened among the survivors of these schools. This is an interesting um, chart that I found on 
indigenous languages in BC, British Columbia, comparing the number in BC to the total across Canada. And you can see that um, this is a, I'm not sure of the methodology of this, but I think this chart represents people who self-identify as being able to speak the language. And you can see that um, there are very few languages in BC, but also in Canada that have um, a large enough number of speakers to, to revitalize the language. So um, it, it's a real challenge at the moment for the um, <clears throat> educational programs to create language nests or other revitalization um, approaches that will allow people who are able to speak the language to share it in, in um, learning contexts with um, very young learners. So it's a pretty depressing situation. And of course, Canada also has um, this history of excluding non-white immigrants. <clears throat> we had the Chinese Immigration Act in 1885, which after the building of the railway across Canada, um, <clears throat> introduced a head tax, which really made it difficult for um, Chinese migrant laborers to stay in Canada or for new migrants to come. And then we also had, <coughs> excuse me, the Komagata Maru incident in 2014, where um, <coughs> migrants from India were not allowed to land on the west coast of Canada and British Columbia for the main reason that they were non-white immigrants. And I think even today, recently, I read that um, that one of the memorial. Oh, did I put 2014? Oh yeah, sorry, that's a typo. Thank you, Ruth. Hold on, I've got to correct that. I was working on this last night at about midnight, one p.m., one a.m. So that's my excuse. <clears throat> and I think recently, one of the memorials to this group of um, people who wanted to come to Canada was um, vandalized here in Vancouver. And then um, we also have the internment of Japanese Canadians and also other groups um, during um, the Second World War. Today, of course, is very different. Here's a, um, a chart of immigrant languages in Greater Vancouver today. And we can see that Chinese languages and Punjabi are the most spoken immigrant languages in Vancouver. And in Greater Vancouver, more than a million people speak a family language. They're actually using the term, <coughs> these data from 2016, I think the census is using the term mother tongue, but they speak a family language other than one of the two official languages, English and French. And you can see the statistics here. I know the new census statistics just came out, but I haven't had the time or the will to upgrade, to upgrade some of these charts that, <clears throat> that um, some kind research assistants did for me. But we can see the number of um, speakers of Chinese languages, Mandarin, Cantonese, other Chinese languages, and <clears throat> NOS, um, non-specified Chinese languages, where the people don't specify which one is 22, 43, 46%. So <clears throat> definitely the Chinese languages are the dominant other languages along with Punjabi in um, Greater Vancouver. Here's a map from a tourist um, site of Vancouver. <clears throat> and here's a language map from the census. This is another old one. This is from 2011, going back to 2006. I couldn't find the updated one. But what we can see here is the diasporic settlement of different groups in the city, here in Richmond, here in Surrey, and different parts of Burnaby and Vancouver. <clears throat> and the reason I'm showing it is because in these dark green areas, 86% um, or more of the people <coughs> describe themselves as being allophones. Now, if you're not from Canada, you might think allophone means they're speaking with a non-standard pronunciation, which is the, one of the sort of linguistic uh, 
um, definitions of allophone going around. But allophone in Canadian census, Canadian census language is somebody who doesn't speak um, one of the official languages. What this means is that in these different parts of the city, it's possible and it's very normal for people to go about their daily lives not using English. Shopping, taking public transit, doing, doing, living their daily lives in um, languages other than English, along with English. <clears throat> and this is also reflected in the higher education institutions where um, if you walk around any of our higher edu education institutions, you'll be hearing many different languages spoken. Okay, here's a quick bit about my um, research background before we start looking at the data. So this is where I work, Simon Fraser University on the Burnaby campus. It's in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. It's quite a spectacular campus with rather brutalist 1960s architecture by Arthur Erickson. Um, <clears throat> I work in the Faculty of Education on the Burnaby campus. I co coordinate a large first year academic literacy course called Foundations of Academic Literacy. And we get anywhere between 300 and 900 students per year with students from all subject areas studying together. And <clears throat> the students who have to take this course through requirement have attained a final secondary school grade of under 75% in um, English, or they have a score of under seven IELTS. And they need to pass this course with a grade C in order to study writing in the disciplines courses. And I also co-coordinate our languages, cultures and literacies PhD program with my colleague, Suzanne Smythe. So the research I'm doing in higher education, <clears throat> I'm looking at research, I'm working with students who speak and write English as an additional language or plurilingual students and looking at um, their language and academic literacy practices. <clears throat> I started my research working with first year students making the transition from secondary to higher education and looking at what happens to their languages and literacies when they move into higher education. Then around 2015, I made a shift because I kind of reached the end of what I could find. And I started looking at what happens to these students when they leave their first year academic literacy program and go and study in the different subject areas. What happens to their language practices, their self perceptions of language use, <clears throat> and how do the instructors in these different subject areas, and today I'll be talking about political science, linguistics, applied sciences, how do instructors deal with classes in which a large number of their students are not communicating in English? And it's been really fascinating research for me to work on. I also, I've, I've also done some large impact assessments of um, <clears throat> how these first year programs affect students' performance and perceptions after they complete them. And the, the recent one I did, we looked at um, <clears throat> how we looked at statistics for around 80,000 students comparing how they perform after this first year academic literacy course versus students who aren't required to take it. Again, some really interesting findings. I'm not a quantitative researcher at all, but I, I, I do find these large data sets quite interesting to, to attempt to understand. <clears throat> I also dabble in linguistic landscaping looking at, at it as a tool for teaching and also um, how the COVID pandemic has altered people's um, behaviours and how signage in public spaces is um, regulating that. And then I also work with um, student teachers or teacher students, you could call them, um, who come to Canada to do study abroad programmes. And I've worked recently, well, no, in the last 10 years, with students from Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Japan, and Taiwan. And this is ongoing research, which I'm hoping to publish this year. And I think like everyone else, I've tried to figure out what's going on with remote learning and how that's affecting our students. So I, I'm working on a project related to that as well. <clears throat> but my current research, all of the research I'm gonna show you today is based on research done in Greater Vancouver, British Columbia, 
with a population of 2.5 million people, of whom more than a million speak immigrant languages, of whom 46% speaking Chinese languages. So I began my research, <coughs> excuse me, looking at um, academic literacies in higher education, trying to really find a framework to understand the whole student experience. So I was strongly influenced by the work of Lee and Street and Street back in 1998 and 2004, which viewed writing as a social practice <coughs> determined in part by the context, cultures and genres in which it occurs. And accordingly, according to Street, um, student writing and learning are, can, and perhaps should be analyzed at the level of epistemology and identities, academic socialization, and study skills such as academic writing. And here's um, <clears throat> a model of, here's a picture of the academic literacies model. The academic literacies model is like an umbrella for um, <clears throat> the whole kind of research lens. And it doesn't replace, but it includes and covers academic socialization. And it also doesn't reject the <clears throat> focus on study skills, ranging from different um, academic literacy skills that students need to learn or teaching things like grammar and pronunciation um, in seminars, for example, they're all part of this model. But my, my interest is particularly as a researcher on these issues of ways of understanding, perceptions of identity and processes of academic socialization. So really the top two um, circles. And the work that I'm doing is, is part of a growing body of work in plurilingualism in Canadian education. And I think it's really exciting to be part of this growing body of researchers. There's a lot of dynamism and there's a lot of really fascinating and interesting research being done. So I'd just like to highlight some of the um, people who've influenced my work in the last few years doing similar work. We've got, um, and it's good to see some of you are here today, Le Chen's work <coughs> um, from her doctoral dissertation, but also beyond looking at um, plurilingual practices and language policies at an international university in Canada, and Corcoran, Gagne, and McIntosh focusing on <clears throat> plurilingual practices and scholarly writing, um, particularly of masters, I think, and doctoral students. And Angelica, I mean, the list could obviously be much longer, but <clears throat> um, I was um, influenced and glad to see that um, there was work being done um, looking at plurilingualism in different English for academic purposes contexts, which have so many um, similarities to the, at least the participants of the studies are very similar to the students that I've worked with here in Vancouver. And then Saskia Van Vegan and Sandra Zappa Holman's work <coughs> looking around plurilingual pedagogies in post secondary contexts. And I know in um, the last couple of years that there, there's been more growth um, in these, you know, from <clears throat> these different scholars and also new scholars who are starting to um, research and publish in this area. And I know at McGill, you've got, um, which is hosting this session, you've got a really great group of um, students and scholars working together. So <clears throat> plurilingualism. Um, to understand and use plurilingualism as a lens, I, I go back to the common European framework of reference for languages, the CEFR, <clears throat> and highlight the, these are the key aspects of plurilingualism, which I look to in my work as analytic lenses, which <clears throat> are located in the um, introductory sections of the CEFR, the use of multiple languages in interactions. Understanding language use as hybrid rather than discrete. This doesn't mean that discrete languages, <clears throat> language practices where people alternate discreetly from one 
language or code to another don't exist, they do. But it's seeing language as one whole hybrid competence rather than um, separate. Plurilingual, well, that's not a good color to choose. Plurilingual, pluricultural competence as uneven. <clears throat> the idea that we have different levels of competence in different languages within this whole hybrid plurilingual repertoire or competence that we have. Whoops. Plurilingual, pluricultural competence is changing. Changing along our, our life paths and in different contexts. The plurilingual speaker is a social agent. <clears throat> There's been some discussion around plurilingualism, some critiques that um, plurilingualism is over agentive because there's so much focus on agency and the individual speaker rather than <clears throat> social context, hegemonic, unfair, neoliberal, cultural, economic, social constraints. But <clears throat> my way of, when, when I looked into this, um, I think a little bit has been lost in translation because a lot of the English language translations about um, plurilingualism are using the term agency. But going back to the original texts from the Council of Europe in French, for example, agency was always referring to a social agent, l'action sociale or l'acte social, for example. <clears throat> so social context has always been accompanying agency from the very first um, literature on the subject. And now there's really a big focus on um, mediation, how individuals um, <clears throat> where gaps in comprehension or the need to um, work between languages with knowledge, they, they work together and play mediation roles. So I'm just gonna show you briefly um, some ideas from an article I re recently wrote, which is in the um, Routledge Handbook of Plurilingual Education. <clears throat> and I wrote this article called, a chapter called Plurilingualism and the Tangled Web of Lingualism. Lingualisms. I'm just trying to really untangle what plurilingualism is and isn't, at least in my own research. I always go back to these traditional views of bilingualism. <clears throat> My understanding of plurilingualism is that it does not require and it shouldn't be defined by native-like control of two languages. I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted here, but um, an important defining feature of plurilingualism <clears throat> and plurilingual competence is that a plurilingual speaker usually has an unbalanced repertoire in terms of competence in different languages and that Despite this imbalance, all of these languages can be tapped into for various social and educational purposes. So, for example, this morning when I saw Angelica, I said, ah, bon dia, tout le bien comme vous êtes. You know, I, I can't maintain a normal Portuguese conversation, but I can still use phrases that I've picked up over the years. And Plurilingualism is not defined by a, a view of utterances or language use that is complete and meaningful, as defined by Horgan um, in his early work, 1953. I mean, we're going back a long way. <clears throat> so for an interaction to be considered bilingual and valid, this was the view. If you're using the term bilingual, you know, people need to understand what you're saying. And these, this language you use needs to be complete and meaningful. Um, and a key feature of plurilingual interactions is the idea that not everyone in a group of speakers needs to understand all of the languages being spoken. <clears throat> in such cases, in, individuals can carry out mediation roles where gaps in comprehension exist. And there's really interesting research being done in, in, in this regard in Switzerland, for example, where um, there's been quite a bit of research on plurilingual practices in <clears throat> um, companies and institutions where three or four different official languages are being used in meetings. 
And when I was recently in Switzerland um, on a visit, I noticed that people are using English now. French speakers are communicating with German speakers in English rather than learning each other's languages. So a plurilingual lens would say that, no, it's okay for you to use French or German or Italian in one of these meetings. Not everyone has to understand everything. We can work together um, to figure out meaning. And then um, plurilingualism is not about alternation between two or more separate or discrete languages, which, which has the idea that for language use to be accepted as bilingual and valid, people should switch between separate compartmentalized languages, which are used monolingually, rendering invalid or at least not accepted as proper bilingual language use, instances in which speakers combine languages hybridly in an interaction. And this um, defining feature goes against the general acceptance today that bilingualism, multilingualism, plurilingualism can be hybrid rather than dual monolingual. In other words, when plurilingual speakers creatively combine languages, they're producing a normal hybrid language form that's not deviant. These are you know, very historically rooted um, understandings around language. And the reason I the reason I go back this far is because the ideas that they're based on and the discourses about what's accepted as normal and acceptable practice in higher education institutions, many aspects of these traditional historical definitions are still alive and well. And I find that in the research that I'm doing, not only instructors, but many students as well um, perceive their own practices according to these traditional views about their own multiple languages. And of course, plurilingualism is often used in conjunction with teaching and learning. <clears throat> um, plurilingual, plurilingual and plurilingualism inspired pedagogy. Um, sorry if I missed out some of you. I know who people today are working in this area. Can't cite everyone. Um, sometimes called plural approaches. And there's no doubt that with its roots in the CEFR, plurilingualism is inherently related to pedagogy in ways that encourage active representation and recognition of different languages and cultures in um, learning environments. And plurilingual teaching approaches are thus aimed at raising language awareness, promoting intercultural understanding, and welcoming the use of languages other than the medium of instruction as, in, as effective tools for learning. And this final part is really the piece that I focus on in my research. Working with instructors and collecting data around students to, to see that um, languages other than English as a medium of, of instruction are useful and essential tools for the learning process. And a learning process which nearly always ends in a monolingual text in academic English, but um, the creation of which can and often does use um, multiple languages and multiple cultural perspectives as well. And then the, the work on um, plurilingual education. I used to refer to this text as Biko and Byron until I started chatting with some French colleagues who asked me, oh, you mean Béacoem et Bichon? And I said, oh yeah, we call, I call it Pico and Byron. But anyway, um, plurilingual education. Um, this is a really interesting text for any of you um, wanting to develop um, tools for plurilingual education. All activities curricular or extracurricular of whatever nature, which seek to enhance and develop language competence and speakers' individual linguistic repertoires. From the earliest school days and throughout life, plurilingual education may also be achieved through activities designed principally to raise awareness of lingu linguistic diversity, but which do not aim to teach such languages and therefore do not constitute language learning in the strict sense. So this definition for me is really important because it takes the focus of plurilingual education beyond the language classroom. 
again from the same text, plurilingual and pluricultural education are inherently linked with the goal to raise awareness and positive acceptance of cultural, religious and linguistic differences and the capacity to interact and build relationships with others. Plurilingualism is seen as, an, as essential for the maintenance of linguistic diversity with the goal of promoting a sense of belonging and a democratic citizenship in Europe. Again, this um, early work is very much focused on Europe. Plurilingualism inspired pedagogy <clears throat> has been characterized as <clears throat> the raising of students' awareness and self-esteem so as to optimize learning, the creation of synergies between languages to reach learning goals, challenging traditional views of language as discrete entities in classrooms, and recognizing that teachers need not necessarily be competent in the languages of the learners. This final point is um, I work with pre-service teachers and in-service teachers. And when we um, here in BC, but also international um, teachers on professional development programs, one of the issues that a lot of teachers have in the kindergarten to grade 12 schooling context is a discomfort that students are using a language in their classrooms that they, the teacher, cannot understand and or cannot speak. So we talk about why you don't need to understand everything that's being said by your students in, in the learning process. And then there's some really interesting dilemmas and problems that come about in those conversations. Um, so I'm now going to just go on to show you some data from my research in Canadian higher education. <clears throat> I've been teaching a master's program this term in uh, on uh, a course on second language education and we did a linguistic landscaping exercise we walked around the campus seeing if we could find representation of other languages and I would say this was at the Burnaby campus of Simon Fraser University I would say it was 99 percent English in a very 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 multilingual multicultural campus these signs a uh, sign for multilingual week up here, um, the sign in Chinese, and the bilingual hand sanitizer sticker in English and French, and a vending, a multilingual vending machine. These were the exceptions rather than the rule. We're talking about um, campuses, well, at least the campus I work on, where English has a very, very, very strong presence. And so we talk, I talked to the students in, in this course, how does it feel walking around this campus, navigating this space surrounded by um, this signage? And again, we have really interesting discussions, which range from, I feel alienated and no sense of belonging to students saying, oh yeah, of course, it's a, it's, we're in Canada, it's an English language university. Why should they put multilingual signs everywhere? So the research that I'm doing I'm, and the, the examples I'm going to show you today are from higher education context, looking at examples of how students negotiate and mediate learning. I'll show you some classroom recordings of plurilingual interactions and also some examples of students note taking in which they combine languages. I'll also show you some data from semi structured interviews that um, I but also we, because we're working with teams of um, research assistants, um, students describing how and why they use languages, how instructors describe and understand their students' practices, and challenges that instructors face in terms of how best to respond pedagogically to plurilingual classrooms. So most of the, this research I carried out with um, my colleague Daniel Moore, who's the co-investigator, and with groups of, with teams of research assistants, um, mostly but not exclusively doctoral students, and doctoral students who are plurilingual, so who are able to um, bring insight into what's going on in different classrooms. This is going back to 2013. Um, this was, I think, the first 
article that I worked on where I worked with Daniel Moore, where I used plurilingualism as a theoretical and methodological lens for my work. And so this image is called accessing multilingual spaces. What we do is we use the classroom as a space in which we can learn about how other languages are used. And we do this by um, asking plurilingual research assistants to go in. So this, this um, research assistant who was on this project was a speaker of Korean, Mandarin, Chinese, English and Japanese. And she went in and she drew diagrams of what was going on. And um, we learned some really interesting things that um, we learned that, again, this is going back um, around 10 years now, but we learned that Korean was a pretty cool language for people to use. And there were examples of um, Chinese students who were adding some Korean into their um, interactions with each other and with Korean students. And this was, you know, when K-pop and Korean culture was, it was before Netflix, but it was still um, <clears throat> becoming very popular. I think it was before Netflix, not sure. And what it um, taught us is that we can't really make assumptions about how and why students use languages in our classrooms. And I'll, I'll give you an anecdote, which is not from a, a class where I was collecting data. It was from a class where I was teaching. And this was a class at SFU. And sorry if some of you have heard this anecdote before, but as I think I'll, I'll share it again, excuse the repetition. But in one of my classes, I had a table like the table here on the bottom left. There were four Chinese students and one Korean student. I'll say Chinese speaking and Korean speaking because I don't know if they were permanent residents, citizens of Canada or, <clears throat> or you know, how they would self-identify. But the, on this table, they were using um, Chinese exclusively, which was really interesting for me because the Korean student was sitting silently and of course, I welcome and encourage um, multiple language uses in my class. But as a, as a teacher, sometimes there's a bit of a dilemma because I'm thinking, well, what's going on here? Because maybe I should be agentive and go and talk to them and say, um, should you maybe be using English as well so that the Korean speaking student can understand? So I went over to the table and I did precisely this. And the Korean student gave me a really surprising response he said oh no he said actually i'm asking the other students intentionally only to speak chinese on this table because i want to learn chinese i'm studying beginners level mandarin and this is my only chance to learn chinese in your class and i thought hold on this is a korean student taking an academic literacy course in english and using it as a space for self-organized immersion experience to learn Mandarin Chinese. And again, so for me, that was, that was, that broke every assumption that I had about teaching and researching and trying to understand what languages, uh, language use means in my classrooms. Okay, I'll show you some data now from the linguistics, applied sciences and political science <clears throat> courses where the research team went in. And this is um, data which really shows the shift that I and we, my fellow researchers, made from looking at the first year academic literacy classroom to try to find out what's going on in the different subject areas. This was a project that um, I did with Daniel Moore called Plurilingualism as an Asset for Learning Across the Disciplines in Canadian Higher Education. And it's, it's a, called a Shirk VPR Bridging Grant. You get this when you didn't get the big grant from the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. But the $10,000 was great because it gave us some money to hire a, a really interesting group of 
research assistants who brought lots of different languages to, the, to their work. We did interviews, classroom observations and recordings, and text analysis. <clears throat> so let's begin by looking at what's going on in linguistics and applied sciences. And the, the, the data I'm going to show you here are about this area of interest I mentioned earlier, the use of other languages as tools for learning. So here's a linguistics class. Um, we had uh, Chinese speaking, Mandarin speaking um, research assistant who was working as a kind of wandering ethnographer in the class, hanging out with the students, sitting down with them and strategically placing digital voice recorders on their, um, it was actually a lecture theater, but in front of them as they were working. And this was um, a linguistics class where they're talking about these things like boundedness and exhaustedness and headedness, the structural linguistics. And um, <clears throat> you can see that they're mixing um, Chinese and English in interesting ways. When I was a PhD student way back in 2000, um, I was interested in things like this. Sometimes they're using English only. Sometimes they're combining Chinese and English. Sometimes they're using Chinese only. So I would interview that my doctoral research was in um, Barcelona in Catalonia working with Latin American immigrants. So I would interview the participants in my study, I'd record them using different languages, um, Catalan and Spanish primarily, but also some um, Brazilian Portuguese as well. And I would ask them how they use languages and why. And often they would just say things like, I've got no idea, that's just how we talk. But what we do is we follow up with the students um, after these recordings and we, we ask them, why don't you use English to study? And when we're lucky, we've got the same students who we've done the recordings for. And here are some of the responses. Um, well, I'll just let, let you read them and I'm focusing on the highlighted sections. So the first one, it improves our study, but also um, above that in study group, these students, they, they self-arrange, excuse me, <coughs> they self-arrange um, with other students who speak the same language and they have um, more experienced or more senior students who join them and help them using Chinese rather than English. It's a, it's a really interesting um, system that takes place. It's, it's been very difficult for me to try and research these practices. Um, the next one, it provides a sense of closeness, easier for understanding each other. If I sit with a group of native speakers, I feel stress. I feel comfortable and more confident. It helps my study. So these are issues that um, we try to develop and understand more and unpack a bit in, in the research. This was the instructor of the same class. We like to hear from the instructors and from their students to, to find out you know, how, they, how their ideas come together. Amy, the instructor said, <clears throat> that's the thing I always worry about. If they're doing too much in Mandarin, then when it's time to talk to me, like, do they have the right vocabulary? So if they learn better all in Mandarin together, I think that's great as long as they can translate that back into English. And, and this is quite interesting, and this was something I found, and I think I talked about it at a recent, um, couple of years ago at the ACLA-CAL conference. 
there's this kind of, I, I call it an immersion myth in higher education where instructors, they're not really aware of the background of their students. And they sometimes perceive um, the use of languages other than English as a lost opportunity to communicate in academic English and maybe a lost opportunity to develop academic English. But as we've seen in the, um, the statistics I presented earlier that, um, <clears throat> Well, re referring to those statistics, a large number of students who are speaking Mandarin together in these classrooms, they already speak perfect English. They might, be, might have been born here or, they, or they've done 10 years of school here. So it's often a matter of choice and comfort rather than um, using the language because their English isn't good enough. There are cases when, when that might be so, but it, it's not always the case. Translators and study groups. I definitely noticed that students of the same language background tend to sit together and make friends with each other. And they do seem to use their native language before class during breaks. And sometimes I hear them talking to each other in mostly Mandarin. I've definitely had students come to office hours in pairs or groups where one is a kind of translator for the rest, which is interesting. So the students, these are very high stakes courses for, for the students. They need to pass them and they need to get grades. And a lot of the students doing the linguistics courses, they may not necessarily be interested in linguistics. They're in the Faculty of Arts and Social Science and they wanna get into business. So they've got to get the grades. And they have very sophisticated um, mechanisms or processes through which they study to make sure that they do well. And this can involve um, bringing translators to office hours with friends, study groups, and also for many of these courses, there are textbooks which have been translated into um, other languages as well. Students having study groups in their native language seems reasonable to me, with one of them gets a the concept a little bit better and they can help to explain it to each other. That seems great. If we can have TAs that can communicate, TAs are teaching assistants in a student's native language, that seems good. Let's go to um, Raj in the Faculty of Applied Sciences. This was a class where um, students were working on creating um, circuit boards that we went in and observed and we talked to the instructor. I heard people talking in different languages. I go and tell them, in English, in English, Actually, I'm discouraging them from dealing with anything other than English. I tell them, look, you talk to each other in English. Somehow try to communicate. But I think the moment there's nobody over their shoulder, then all of that disappears and they feel more comfortable talking in Korean, Punjabi or Chinese. So some instructors get a bit exasperated when their students do activities and they're not speaking in English. And Raj was an example. And particularly in the applied sciences, the, the idea of the English language workplace where people would be ne needing to work effectively in English as engineers or other um, applied sciences um, jobs loomed large over their understanding of their role as, in, as instructors. But at the same time, um, some of the instructors can be a bit of a contradiction as well. We saw here that Raj has a pretty um, English only emphasis in his classes, but at the same time, he hires plurilingual teaching assistants, not without problems. Now I'm trying to, at least two languages, one Persian and one Chinese, and that helps considerably. He's talking about the hiring of teaching assistants. I have a couple of TAs, they're very good technically, but if I expect them to explain this to a student in English, then nothing because they cannot say anything. That's when I've had difficulty when we wanted the TAs to help the students in the lab, but inevitably the instructor would end up standing next to the TA. So the whole purpose of the TA helping, dot, dot. <clears throat> so again, this is one of the dilemmas of um, somebody, particularly with a you know, traditional mindset that this should be in the English only classroom, going to the effort to hire plurilingual teaching assistants, but then finding that it creates perhaps as many problems as it solves. 
at least in his mind. Okay, let's move on to get a taste of the research from political science. The focus here was teaching and learning through a second and third language, understanding the whole learning experience. The context of this study is a French language program in a multicultural Anglophone university in which students study political science and public administration. The program is funded by the Canadian federal government. And many of the students taking it are looking to land nice jobs in the bilingual federal government. And most of the students taking this program are graduates of British Columbia's French immersion schools. You'd be surprised, remember the distance I, sh I showed you earlier between Quebec and BC, and the fact that there are only um, <clears throat> are between one and 2% um, francophone, self-declared francophones in the province. I think up to around 10% of students in BC take French immersion at some stage of their schooling. So there's a very large, let's say Francophile population in the province, which is, you know, we, the term is used to describe people who basically have done French immersion and who are able to communicate in French, but they, they rarely use it in their daily lives. Here are some language portraits that we did as part of the um, <clears throat> project where we asked students to draw their languages, their use on their body with different colors. So let's look at the issue around language of instruction. Here are two of the instructors, Jules and Dominique. We, we really wanted to figure out in this environment where in an Anglophone dominant university where courses were being taught through French, what was the decision-making process for these instructors? <clears throat> Jules said, je parle comme je vous parle maintenant. J'encourage à poser des questions en français, mais s'il me pose une question en anglais, Je leur interdis pas de tout. Je vous vois les étudiants, c'est important parce que ça crée une distance. Dominique, however, is like a mirror image of Jules. Utilisez les mots les plus simples possibles. J'essaie souvent de les encourager à leur dire que je ne suis pas une figure d'autorité. Je parle un peu plus lentement, je fais vraiment très attention pour bien articuler. Ce qui est permis dans la classe, c'est juste français. So we, we see here that there's no one way of doing things. We have Jules, who's really keen to create a distance and uses the formal vu form with the students, as opposed to Dominique, who really doesn't want to be an authority figure. And Dominique speaks slowly. Um, he changes his French for these students, whereas Jules speaks to them as he's speaking um, at, at, at the time of the interview. So I'll be finishing off shortly. And then we ask the instructors to talk about um, how their students are, are communicating. So Dominique says, if I'm explaining the concept of the revolution of rights of Miguel Ignatieff, and I explain an idea that's a little more complex, one of my students will turn to Sasha and they're gonna whisper in English. And this is it, the students whisper in English in these classes. Okay, I'll just finish off by showing you some notes. This is from one of the classes where the student is using French exclusively, except for the name Canadian Pacific Railway. And the date in um, Japanese. In these notes, the students doesn't address all of the issues. Some cannot be explicitly stated, cannot let rights évahir la totalité du discours, crise de la famille, lack values, quality of life. When I was a grad student, I called this intrasentential code switching, but I guess we, you know, we call it translanguaging now. And um, we've then got some very complex issues around students' identities. Michelle 
So we talk to students about their identities and we ask them to draw language portraits as well. I'm Canadian with an Asian background. I pretty much just say Asian because I have my Asians. Well, I'm Japanese and Mandarin and Taiwan and China. So it's a bit, and of those Asians, you speak Mandarin. Yeah, do you understand any Japanese? No, have you ever been to any of these countries? I've been to Taiwan, I've been to Malaysia. They speak Mandarin too. And in Taiwan, I think some old people speak Japanese as well, don't they? Yeah, my grandma speaks Japanese very well, actually, but my grandpa's from China, so he doesn't like it. Brenda, I'm kind of in between. So I, I like, I speak English and Western languages fluently, but I'm Asian at heart. The thing is when people look at a Chinese girl, like Asian girl, like me, they probably like, oh, you know, Chinese, fresh from China, whatever, or Taiwan, whatever. But the thing is to defend myself, to say I'm Canadian, I would tell them I speak English and French. What now? That's basically like the kind of defense, the defense that I use. Because if I speak English and French fluently, who are you to tell me that I'm not Canadian? So French is part of my identity as a Canadian. Really complex issues around identity, which are under, underpinning the language practices of the students. And to finish off the final two questions, we look at the teacher's professional identities. What's their role? Are they teachers of content or language? Jules sees himself as a content teacher and Dominique as a hybrid. And I'll skip that. So here's the reference list of the um, sources from today's talk. And images. And we've got time now for questions and answers.